let's get into the word tonight and um, lesson two, the parables of Jesus. Father, thank you for the opportunity to come before you tonight. Thank you for folks that have come. I know it's a difficult time to come out. There's a lot of sickness. So much has touched um, <coughs> excuse me, our society and our church as well. So we know that um, it, it takes a special, special determination to get out. And uh, we want to say thank you for those that have come. We ask you to bless those that are not with us tonight, especially those that are unable to be here. We pray for those that are sick, that you would send a blanket of healing over our congregation. Do your mighty work, we pray, in the name of the Lord Jesus. Father, we pray for the grace of God to cover every uh, uh, area of our lives so that even though we're in a time of, uh, of sickness and difficulty, we will also be in a time of amazing grace. Um, Lord, I'm not implying that the sickness is sin, but there's a principle in Scripture. You said through the Apostle Paul that where sin abounds, grace abounds more. So the principle is that whenever anything unpleasant touches our lives, whether it's sickness or anything else, that your grace is abounding in response. So we ask for that grace to cover us tonight and give us help. We look to you and give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Um, we said that we were going to spend a couple of weeks on introductions uh, in regard to the parables. And um, I, I, I really, <laughs> last week I, I really covered almost lessons one and three in their entirety. Um, I went a little deeper than I had intended to go, so I may adjust a little bit for next week. But um, uh, we talked a lot about understanding parables, why Jesus chose parables and the way parables worked, what it meant to have something cast alongside, and um, how we draw wisdom from those things and how we interpret those things. Tonight, I want to talk about the dynamics of the parables. Basically, what that means is I want to tell you what the parables talk about. Uh, that's probably going to be the way that we study the parables. Uh, we'll study them in groups depending on their, uh, on their purpose. Um, for us, which I had originally thought I would do, it would probably take us through the end of the year to cover each and every parable, um, and not all of them are, um, w would fill a whole lesson. Some would and some wouldn't, so I've got to do a little balancing act here. But I want to tell you how we're going to be looking at the parables. Um, 3, 6, 9, 10, 3, 6, 9, 10, 10 or 11 groups uh, of parables that... Um, We'll, we'll be taking a look at. I want to explain to you, first of all, that there are two dynamics of the parables. Um, first of all, there are positive and negative parables. Now, what do you mean, Pastor, by negative? Jesus, nothing Jesus said is negative. It's all good and it's all positive. Well, I, I don't mean, that's not a, 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 a judgment on what he said that's talking about the nature of it. What I mean is this, when I say some are positive and some are negative, the positive parables are what we would call parables of comparison. Now, I know comparison can be good, good or bad. You know, we, I, you, you've heard people say, you're just like your mother. And is that good or bad? You know, uh, it, it could be either. Hopefully when we say something like that, it would always be good. But there are parables of comparison. For instance, uh, in the parable of the sower, Jesus was saying the kingdom of God is like seed that is spread abroad. And, um, uh, and then he talks about the soil the various types of soil that receives the seed. It's really more a parable about the soil than the seed, although the seed is certainly important. But Jesus said, if you want to understand the kingdom, understand the seed and the soil, and you'll understand something about the kingdom. Um, or um, the, the uh, kingdom 
is like a treasure in a field. Uh, we talked about this last week, of utmost value. Do whatever you have to do to get the field so you'll have the treasure. And, um, or the kingdom of God is like leaven, uh, which a, a lady takes and puts in a measure of meal, and before long it spreads throughout the meal. So there are things, this is what the kingdom of heaven is like. It's like this. But then there are also parables of contrast, and the parables of contrast are the, are the ones that sneak up on us um, because they're not identified as a parable of contrast. Um, Jesus taught us to pray using some very bad examples, uh, like the unjust judge he said, uh, I don't regard man, I don't regard God, I'm going to make any law that I want to make, but this woman keeps banging on my door saying, give me justice, give me justice, give me justice. And if you're not careful, you will have an image of God that we have to keep banging on his door. He's uncaring doesn't matter to him if we have what we need or not, but if we can just worry him long enough, he'll say, all right, Justin, you can have it. Well, there are several parables like that, but what we find out is those are not parables of comparison. He's not saying God is like that. He's saying just the opposite. He said, I want you to pray all the time and I want you to have faith because that is not what your father is like. He was saying, if... This woman, by her persistence, can get an uncaring, unsympathetic, unethical judge to give her what she wants. If, if persistence can do that with a wicked person, how much more so does God, who loves us and pays attention to us, give ear to our requests that we keep bringing before him. So that's a, that's a parable of contrast. He said persistence works even in bad situations. How much more so does it work in good relationships? So um, there are parables of comparison. There are parables of contrast, positive and negative. There are also parables, some speak of now, and some speak of later. Um, we can look at it this way. The Old Testament was pointing to the dynamics of the kingdom. Now, the, 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 there is plenty of kingdom teaching in the Old Testament, but it's almost like you have to have the New Testament to look back and see it. Um, the Old Testament was uh, it, it was called a teacher or a schoolmaster that brought us to a place of understanding. Um, so the Old Testament pointed to the fullness of the kingdom. When you read the Gospels, you see the kingdom being birthed. It's like the birth of a child, you know, and and you know, beginning beginning with the announcement by the angels that something wonderful is happening and. Someone fantastic is coming. The Gospels are, are a revelation of that man, uh, the God-man who came to bring the kingdom to earth. Jesus didn't teach a lot of the heavier doctrine. I, I read an article by a, a person that I consider to be a liberal, not a conservative Bible scholar, and they said, Jesus was a good teacher, but how dare Paul, how dare Paul think he could take the teaching further and explain it in more depth? That's an insult to Jesus. No, goodness, no. It, he doesn't understand what God was doing. The Old Testament prophets were pointing to the kingdom that was coming. Jesus and his life said, the kingdom is here. Look at this. Everything Jesus did was to announce the kingdom. And after Jesus died and was raised from the dead, he put the church in place to take us into the depths of his teaching. It was by design. Paul didn't have more insight than Jesus. 
Paul didn't have more revelation than Jesus. Everything Paul got, he got from Jesus. It's sort of like um, I was going through some pictures the other day, and um, uh, I, I looked at a picture of one of the kids. And uh, it, well, I looked at all of them, but I but I remember thinking. I look at these baby pictures, whether it's my boys or my girls, I look at them and I say, boy, I, I, I looked at them when they were born and didn't have any idea what they were going to be like or what they were going to look like. The only thing I knew is that they were chitties. They were chitties. Um, it was on their birth certificate. It was in my heart. I knew who they were, but they were just little squirmy poopy things about this big, you know. The biggest one of them was not even eight and a half pounds, you know. And one of them was just a little over two pounds. I mean, they're just little bitty things. And I looked at them and I thought, the only thing I know is this is the name I'm giving you and you are a chitty. But I look at those pictures now and I see them as adults. I look at them and I say, well, of course I know who this is. I can, this, is this is Molly, this is Rebecca, this is Jeremy, this is Joey. Because I didn't understand it at the time, but everything they were going to be was in there. It was in there. And um, I think when Jesus came and gave us the Gospels, he gave us the, the fledgling form of the kingdom. But everything about the kingdom was in there. But it would take the church being discipled. It would take the church beginning to grow. It would take the apostles. The Bible says that the apostles were the foundation. Uh, Jesus was the chief cornerstone. But the, but the apostles laid the foundation. And then everything we do is built upon that foundation. So um, we, we need to understand, and we've talked about this before, that when you think of the gospel, when you think of Jesus' life, some of what Jesus was talking about was right now. The kingdom of God is with you. But Jesus was also laying a foundation for us to grow and for the kingdom to grow and for everything to come to a place of maturity. We talked about this in other Bible studies, and uh, not this Sunday. This Sunday I'm going to preach what I was going to preach last Sunday, about the seasoning of, uh, uh, of fullness. But the, the Lord willing on, uh, what would that be, on the 23rd, I'm going to talk to you, I'm going to, I'm going to start part one of the fullness, and I'm going to talk to you about a dozen or so words, words that we, we talk about a lot, but I want us to slow down for about four or five weeks, maybe as many as six weeks um, uh, and I want us to understand, I think the greatest flaw in the church by far is that we teach, we teach salvation, but we don't teach how magnificent it is. We act like it's just a choice we make to decide we're going to join Kiwanis. Or we decide that we'll be a Clemson fan instead of a Carolina fan. And we need to understand that this is more, it is a choice, but God does something absolutely phenomenal in us that, that I think one of the greatest regrets we'll have in heaven is that we didn't take time to learn what has happened to us here on earth. And we're going to find that there are four sets of words. And we're not talking about parables now, but we're talking about words like... Uh, sanctification, redemption, um, um, words like justification, uh, words like that, uh, glorification. We're going to talk about a dozen or so words that summarize the, the wonderful experience called salvation. And what we're going to find out is that these words are indicative of... Um, First of all, the choice that we make, we are called upon to make a choice. Now, we can't even make the choice unless God touches our heart. 
But then there are words that talk about not the choice that we made, you know, choice words like repentance. I choose to repent. I choose to be converted. Um, but then there are words that talk about the change that occurs in us. We are not what we used to be when we come to Jesus. So there are words that say there's a great choice to be made. And then there are words that say when you make this choice, there is a change in you that is so far reaching and so fantastic and so magnanimous on the part of God that you change into another creature altogether. And then there's a set of words that talk about the consequences um, of my choice. Things like adoption and redemption. Uh, because I choose Him and He changes me, there are consequences in my life. And Jesus didn't talk a lot about those things. He left that to the apostles. But, um, and then after the consequences, there are challenges. You know, living it out and waiting for redemption, waiting for, for the total completion, the finishing of this project. So it'll kind of tie into the parables, uh, but we're going to be taking a look at some very special words. And what we've talked about before is we've said that salvation is in three tenses. Now you've got that down. I don't, I, I don't even think I need to spend a lot of time there but I may do it for folks that are new to our church or haven't heard the teaching on it. But there are scriptures that make it very clear that salvation is something in the past. Um, I, I was saved. You know, you were saved. Uh, for by grace were you saved. Salvation has its roots and its foundation in the past. But salvation is also very much in the present. It's ongoing. There are scriptures uh, that tell us that we are being saved, especially in the pastoral epistles. There's aorist tense and present tense, and we don't need to get into that now. Save it. But um, it, it's, not only, it's not only something that happened, but it's a process that's going on and developing right now in my life. Um, I, 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 the older I get, the more I become like my dad. In, in appearance. Um, now, it's probably always been that way, but I didn't know my dad as a young man. I didn't know my dad as a boy. The fact of the matter is I've probably been looking like my dad for decades, but, but I didn't know my dad. I didn't relate to my dad until he was, was in his 40s. So we're finding out that God is doing something in us right now that will one day be perfected and completed. He said that um, uh, we shall be saved. So we're going to understand those tenses, but let's look at the now and later of the parables very quickly here. Um, uh, there are, um, there's at least one major parable, the first one, and I think this is why Jesus started with this one in his teaching of the parables, the, the issue of life where he talked about the soil and the seed, he said everything in your life depends on how you respond to the word. See, that's what Psalm 1 says. Psalm 1 says, blessed is the man that doesn't walk in the way of the wicked or stand in the way of the ungodly. He doesn't sit in the seat of the scornful but his delight is in the law of the Lord. Psalm 1 begins, says there's, there's two types of people in the world. One is blessed, one is cursed. The one that is blessed responds to the word of God. The one that is cursed, he walks, he sits, he stands in the world's view of things. And Jesus' first parable was teaching us everything, your fruitfulness, where you end up, how you relate to others, everything will hinge on how you respond to the Word of God, okay? Um, the second, uh, this, and the second one is a group of parables. <coughs> um, the, the soil and the seed kind of stands alone. Um, there's a, not any other parables that, that relate the Word to us in the same way. But this, um, 
The second group of parables helps us understand lostness. Uh, what does it mean to be lost? We all we like sheep, Isaiah said, have, uh, have all we like sheep have gone astray, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Um, what what is the required action and response to be recovered from a state of lostness? Now there are some easy ones, you know, like the lost sheep, the lost coin. And it's even an inference in the lost son or the parable son. He wants us to understand we are lost. Um, And he doesn't paint our lostness in glowing terms. He doesn't say you are just, you are just, you know, you just need a nudge in the right direction. No, he chose us, you know, he called us sheep. And I've often wondered why he called us sheep. It's probably the most common picture he could have used. Let me tell you about sheep, and I've been around sheep. I love sheep, um, uh, but I, I'll tell you what I know about sheep. Number one, they are they are not the sharpest tool in the shed. Uh, Adrian Rogers put it this way: Sheep are dumb, sheep are defenseless, and sheep are dependent. And um, I I think that is a pretty good picture of our lostness. Uh, you don't go to the circus and see trained sheep. You just don't see that much. They're sweet animals. They're loving animals. Uh, one of the best animals I've ever had was a goat, which is related to the sheep. Old Higgins, he would, I lived in a parsonage next to the church, and Higgins would walk with me to the office every day and sit outside until I was done and then walk with me home. He'd ride with me on errands. Everything that... Uh, uh, that I would let him do, he would do. Somebody came to the parsonage with a kind of a prophecy that was written down, kind of a, a complaint about things. And she opened the door, left her door open to let me know she wasn't going to stay long. And I think it was God. I think it was God. Higgins went, got in her front seat, and ate her prophecy. Um, of course, that had happened with a lady that brought a good word too. But the point I'm the point I'm making is that Higgins was great. Sheep sheep are not hateful animals, but they're not they're they're not trained trainable even the way some other animals are. Um, he said that they are dumb. He said that they are defenseless. That's why sheep need shepherds. Uh, you know, uh, I I love. What Molly, my daughter, bought for me, one of the things she got for me for Christmas was a sign to, to go on my hen house, my hen, my chicken pen. It says, beware of chickens. You are liable to be killed, maimed, and another word I forget. You have been warned. Be careful of these chickens. Of course, none of that's true, but... I love, I love, you know, sheep are like chickens. They can't really take care of themselves. Uh, they need a shepherd. The sheep will put themselves in danger. A, sh- a sheep will um, uh, uh, even go to places where they are in danger. In fact, a sheep, because of the way it has to clip the grass, sheep have been known to just eat, 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 and walk off a cliff, just walk off the cliff eating. Um, and the shepherd, that's why he had that crook, you know. And that's what Jesus referred to us. And he's the good shepherd. And we're the sheep. We need his protection as well as his direction. And um, sheep are dependent. Sometimes sheep can get so heavy with wool that when they get down, they can't get up. If they eat the wrong type of grass... It can create a problem of such bloating. They go down and they can't get up. So a lot of the shepherd's job is just pick up the sheep and help them to keep moving. So Jesus went to some great parables to teach us what it means to be lost. The, The parable of the lost coin teaches us about the shame that is associated. Uh, the, The sheep may be about the hopelessness or the helplessness, but the coin teaches us about the shame of being lost. We'll we'll talk about um, uh, about those sets of parables 
when we get to them. There are other parables that teach us about grace and responsibility. I think the prodigal son is one of a very small group, but a very powerful parable. The, the, the prodigal son is a, a parable about recovering brotherhood. Um, I, there's some great lessons about the prodigal son, but I think as we brought out last week, I think the heart of the thing is toward the elder brother because of who Jesus was talking to. Um, there are parables, number four, that have to do with Israel, the future of the chosen people and the identity of a true Israelite. Um, when we get to these parables, we'll understand one of the things that Jesus, that got him in trouble, the thing that got him in trouble more than anything else is that he claimed to be God. Uh, used the phrase son of man, and he, he clearly claimed to be God. That's why the Pharisees killed him. Uh, you remember they said, we don't, we don't kill you for doing this. We kill you because you said you were the uh, that you were God. Um, and, and, um, the, but the thing other than that, that got Jesus, I think, in more hot water than anything, is he says, you're not a Jew just because you were born a Jew. Abraham is able to raise up children of these stones. And he said, you're putting all your trust in your birth certificate but he said, that's not what a real Jew is at all. Um, so he taught some parables about Israel. He taught about the present kingdom. And he gave us several parables that tell us how important it is to make the right choice. Um, we believe in the sovereignty of God. We talked about this at length last week. We believe that God calls us. There's no doubt about that. Without his calling, we cannot respond um, uh, we know that, we, we are certain of that, but so much depends on our choices, and our choices are not by cosmic design. God did not make us accept or reject. God knows about it, and He has a plan of foreknowledge and predestination for those that will respond, but our choices are of vital importance, and He teaches us in the parables how to choose. Then he teaches us about discipleship. He says it's not enough to just make a choice. You have to follow through on the choice. He talked in Luke chapter 9, I think it was. He said a person that sets their hand to the plow and then looks back is not fit for the kingdom. So there's the idea of discipleship where you, um, where you not only make a decision, but you pay the price to, to follow the Lord. And then there's several parables about stewardship. Um, I, I always kind of cringe a little bit when I hear uh, teachers say that Jesus talked more about money than he did any other subject. That's just not true because the way they present it is that Jesus, one of the most important things to him was money. So he taught about money so much. That's just not true. Jesus used money to illustrate stewardship. Uh, he, he was not obsessed with money. It, money was not his number one teaching theme. Stewardship of life was very important. And he often used money um, to, to illustrate that. So I think we need to adjust a little bit uh, when we think about Jesus teaching about money. He did make some principles about money very, very clear. But it was uh, almost without exception, it was in the context of just like you manage your money, you have to manage your life. It was to, it was to illustrate stewardship. Um, he taught us about prayer. And, and in those parables about prayer is inherent in all of those teachings is that God is our Father and one that we respond to. Um, uh, it's not that he said, I want to teach you to pray and I want to teach you that he's your father. The whole teaching of prayer works because he said you are praying to your father. So those two things are not two different subjects. They're one in one. True prayer is never what God wants it to be until we realize that we're praying to our father. 
Um, <clears throat> let's, uh, let's wrap this up with the last two. There are um, teachings, parables about eschatology. Um, and, um, and he, you know, eschatology is that $4 word. Eschaton means the last things, and logi or ology always means a study about or a word about. Um, a word about the last things. Uh, pneumatology is a word about the spirit, the, the wind of God. Um, and eschatology is the last thing. He talks about judgment. He talks about the future kingdom. He talks about uh, eternal damnation and an, an eternal uh, salvation. Jesus taught a lot of parables about eschatology. Much of what we know about judgment was because of the, uh, and the return of the Lord, because of the parables that Jesus taught. There's a couple of parables. We don't know if they are parables or, 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 or literal stories, true stories, um, like um, the rich man and Lazarus. There are some scholars that think that's a parable. Others think it was a real story with Lazarus and, and, a, and a rich man. And um, I I, I tend to think that it was a, a real story instead of a parable because Jesus gave names. Um, the parables tend to be there was a certain man or there was a certain woman or there was a judge or there was a householder, but we have names given in uh, the story of the rich man and Lazarus. I think it was a true story, but what I'm trying to say is this, whether that's a true story or a parable, it teaches us something about judgment that is very important. Um, and then there's a couple of parables. Um, I told you last week I went into way more detail than I meant to, and I'm sorry. But we said there's at least one, maybe as many as two or three, that um, it's very difficult for us to understand exactly what Jesus is saying. And it may be that there are multiple uh, points to that parable, but that's not the way a parable is used. It could be that we're just not sure of exactly, um, the, we're, not, we're not positive, I should say. It's not that Jesus said things that don't make sense, but we're not sure if he was saying this or saying this, and we'll deal with those one or two, maybe three parables um, as, we, as we come to the end. Um, we know God's word is true, just sometimes we don't know everything we think we know. And we have to, we have to grow in those things. So uh, as we, as we uh, deal with the parables, we're going to be um, looking at parables that are parables of comparison, parables of contrast. And then we're going to look at parables that have to deal with now and parables that will have to deal, uh, have to do with later. Next week, the parable we begin with is that first one, the parable of the sower or the, the, the soil and the seed. And uh, that's where we'll get start taking the parables one at a time. Uh, usually each week we'll do two or three parables. Next week we'll just do the one because it's very long. It's the one that Jesus, it's, it's a long parable, number one. And then number two, uh, we read about the reaction of the people and Jesus' explanation of the parable. Jesus doesn't explain all the parables, but he explains this one. This is, this is the way that I, I, I would love for all of the parables to be told. This is the parable. Here are the questions the disciples had, and here's what it means. But we don't have that with all the other parables. But it's like Jesus was getting, you know, that was like parables 101. So that's where we'll start next week. Thank you.